Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Cheetash. My name is Chris, and today we are continuing along our journey through the book Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion by Dr. Robert Cialdini. Today, talking about chapter six from the book, Scarcity, and another lever of influence we get into. Last time we talked about, what was it, authority last time, and how authority can be used to influence. We talked about the difference between being in authority and being an authority. We also talked about the different ways authority presents itself by titles, by trappings such as designer clothing, etc. We also talked about how being an authority can cause kind of a halo effect and make a person seem more desirable, more favorable in other areas other than their expertise. But today we're going to talk about scarcity. And scarcity at its basic point is the less of something in society, the more valuable it becomes. I first learned about scarcity from probably economics class, right? Where you see as the supply of an item decreases, the price of it or like the value of it goes up. You know, that I think that's where I first learned the term scarcity. And it can be, again, just another very, very powerful tool to get compliance from other individuals. So Dr. Cialdini starts off this chapter talking about an anecdote, like as he has done in all the other previous chapters. And he talks about this story with a friend of his who's a marriage dispute resolution attorney. Basically, it sounds like they're a divorce attorney. I I don't know why they use kind of all this like word salad here. Marital dispute resolution attorney. Okay, you're a divorce attorney. And the attorney is trying to get like a favorable deal for both sides. So they use, Dr. Cialdini's friend tends to use this phrase when they actually do come to a deal. And she says, okay, when she goes to present it to her client, client, all you have to do is agree to this proposal and we will have a deal. Dr. Cialdini says, I thought I recognized the problem and suggested a minor wording change to it. We have a deal. All you have to do is agree to this proposal. Do you guys see the difference there? And it it took me a while to get the difference there. So you can see the two quotes on the screen. All you have to do is agree and we have the deal versus we have a deal. All you have to do is agree. And how... Her, uh, Dr. Cialdini's friend found that she had more success, more compliance when she phrased it via the second bullet point because this bullet point is highlighting scarcity. It's highlighting the fact that, hey, there is a deal already in place, but if you don't agree to it, we're going to lose it. So you're avoiding the fact of a loss in this situation versus in the beginning, you haven't gotten the deal yet. You still have to agree to it so you don't have anything. But in the second one, you have the deal. Now you don't want to lose it. And maybe this isn't really so much a scarcity as so as it is the prospect theory from Danny Kahneman and from the book Thinking Fast is Slow. I think it's either the prospect theory or the the unitary theory where humans tend to want to avoid losses versus having any sort of gains. Essentially, and that's a great book. We should do that for the channel too. Losses hurt more than gains make you happy. We are loss averse. Like we want to do anything to avoid losing things. We'd rather not lose than gain, essentially. And that's kind of what's happening here. And it's kind of like scarcity too, because I'm sure these deals are hard to come by, right? So you want to avoid losing the deal because it's so hard to come to a deal in the first place. 
scarce. Next, Dr. Cialdini gives another little anecdote here of a Florida State University cafeteria study where they rate the food in the cafeteria. And at first, they rate it as unsatisfactory. Nine days later, a second survey they did amongst those students showed that they changed their minds and they actually viewed the food at the cafeteria as more favorable on the second survey. Now, why is that? Because totally external to the study, a fire happened in the cafeteria, which shut down the cafeteria for a period of time. So all of a sudden, the ability, the availability to get food has decreased. And I'm sh- Listen, I'm sure Florida State University, you're at a large, you know, power five school. There's other places to eat on campus. But, you know, for those who are close to this particular cafeteria, all of a sudden their main place to eat is gone. So they're going to view the food maybe not so much as a luxury now, but more as maybe like a necessity. And it's just now become a little bit more scarce. Same thing with iPhone buyers. People who were in line to get the latest iPhone, they actually trade spots in line for it. And they actually, they mentioned a lady in here who they were talking to, like, why did you trade a spot in line? Like you gave up, I think it was a purse, like a very like designer purse for a spot for going up in the line to buy this iPhone. And she said, because she didn't want to lose the chance to get one. And the Apple store only stocks like a certain amount of these iPhones. And again, it's the motivation is to not lose something versus gaining something. And with that, let's get into the the meat and potatoes of scarcity. Less is best and loss is worst. So the basic definition here, opportunities seem more valuable to us when they are less available. And that, let me just go through here. You know, you you see this too. (laughs) I see this at least looking at my bullet points here that I wrote. Uh, Answering an unknown phone number, you always kind of think like, oh, this is an unknown phone number. This could be a a once-in-a-lifetime job opportunity. This could be somebody wanting to, I don't know, give you give you money. This could be like a celebrity. This could be like an attractive girl, an attractive man giving you a call and what have you. So you answer the phone because of the unknown factor of who's on the other side of it. Another anecdote here about scarcity was uh, preventing losses on an energy bill versus applying a saving. Let me see if I can find this. Find this anecdote for you guys. I think it was here in the United Kingdom. Residents were 45% more likely to switch to a new energy provider if the change would prevent a loss on their bill as opposed to providing a saving. Scarcity. And then some other anecdotes here, lot where losses tend to have a greater impact on attention, on arousal, on brain activation. So as far as these little anecdotes here go, people are more likely to cheat to avoid a loss than to obtain a gain. Team members were 82% more willing to cheat to avert a drop in status on the team than to experience an equivalent climb in status. So they would rather cheat to stay where they're at versus working super, super hard to gain a status. It's kind of how I take that. Losses have greater impact on, again, on gaze, on heart rate, pupillary dilation, and on cortical stimulation. The precious mistake, too. Oh, What I meant by this bullet point was that, for example, on like trading cards, I had a trading card. I remember it was a LeVar Arrington rookie card. I think he played at Penn State. He was like the number one overall pick in um, 
like 2002, 2003, something like that. I believe he was the number one overall pick. And I had his rookie card, only it wasn't his rookie card. It was a mistake. It mistakenly printed like rookie on it. I think it was from Topps, famous like sports card memorabilia brand. And the thing is, this mis- this precious mistake is like more valuable because there's not much of it. In the same fashion, you know, you get like weird prints on coins. I think Dr. Cialdini talks about, and all of a sudden those become valuable, more valuable than the actual value of the coin. Like you have like a nickel that's printed wrong, like in God we trust versus in God we trust. You know, I do that on my PowerPoints all the time. You guys have seen I make spelling mistakes and stuff. Only, you know, on on currency, it's actually more valuable because those mistakes don't happen very often. They're very rare. So they're valuable to possess them. And this was just another another example, another little anecdote here. Medical examinations to check for certain ail- ailments do better if not checking leads to a loss in a certain area in somebody's life. So as like an example, um, people are more likely to go in to get their vision checked if you present it to them in the fashion that, hey, if you don't get your vision checked, you're going to lose the ability to read to your grandson, granddaughter, son, daughter, etc. Versus if you say, hey, you should get your vision checked to make sure you can still you can still see, you know, versus, hey, you want to make sure you don't lose the ability, lose that ability so you can help somebody else out, read to your son and daughter. So there's kind of like a, I don't want to say reciprocation, but not social proof either, but maybe a unity principle here in connecting you to like a family member. And we're going to talk about unity as the last lever of influence in one of the last episodes. So how can scarcity work as a compliance tool? It can can work in different ways. One is using this, I don't want to say law, but principle or rule of limited numbers. So using the short supply of something to make it more valuable and therefore making a person comply with that request to obtain that thing that's in short supply. So booking.com showed this, exemplified this, in that they showed on their website the limited availability of certain rooms. And they saw their prices skyrocket because of that because people were more willing to pay for those rooms that were in short supply. So I'm guessing like on their website, they would say, oh, only only two rooms left, only five rooms left, only one room left. And coincidentally, people would be more willing to pay for that room because, hey, I, I got to get this room before somebody else does. You guys see what I'm, you guys see how that works? Um, appliance store tactic, you know, I could imagine doing this, you know, people doing this at, I don't know, Home Depot or ABC Warehouse, where you tell a customer, oh, tell, especially if you tell a customer that you see looking at like a washer, dryer, fridge, what have you, that, oh, that particular appliance you're looking at, sir, ma'am, has already sold, unfortunately. And they say, oh, gosh, darn it, I really, really wanted it. So then as the salesperson, you get that to them to commit to it as if they did have it in stock. And so you say something like, oh, so, yeah, you know, I'm sorry we don't have it. But if we did, like, you would be really interested in it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, gosh, I was really hoping to get this particular, you know, washing machine. And that just is too bad that you do have it. And we're going to talk about commitment and consist- consistency as a principle next episode. And then lo and behold, they go into the back of the warehouse and they find, oh, we j- we actually do have that washer, dishwasher in stock. So maybe they would even say, oh, we only have one left. To again, show you that there's a limited number of them 
to make you want to purchase it and kind of get that fear of missing out, that FOMO in your brain, but also getting you to commit to it beforehand. Like, oh, if we did have it in stock, you would purchase it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I really would. And Cialdini talks about it in there in, in this chapter. You, you be careful of those tricks. And we're going to talk about that in the defense, how to defend against these this certain lever of influence. So limited numbers, another way it is used is in this limited time. Limited time principle. So how does this work? It basically says that, hey, you only have a, a certain time frame to have access to a particular item, to a particular location, to do a certain thing. So it's not in the limited quantity of it, it's in the limited period of availability that you have at that certain product, item, what have you. Dr. Cialdini talks about a personal anecdote where Mormon churches out in, oh gosh, I, I, um, I think it was Colorado? Mace, oh, Arizona. Arizona, yeah. Mesa, Arizona. And how the Mormon churches normally don't allow non-Mormons into their church, but for certain time periods, they do. And I think it's in particular when they add on or like make new constructions to the church, they'll actually open it up to the public, but those don't happen very often. And Dr. Cialdini talks about how he, he wanted to go really bad to visit the Mormon church. And I've heard, and I think he talks about in the book too, that they are like just spectacles, beautiful constructions, beautiful architecture. But if you don't go in that time period, you might never get that opportunity again. So again, it's like that that fear of missing out that if I don't do it now, I'll never get the chance to do it. Another way this is used by salespeople is by using this deadline tactic. You know, if you don't buy it now, the price is going to go up. Or if you don't buy it now, we're going to run out of supply of this one thing. You know, going back to like the dishwasher example, yeah, if you, if you don't buy this dishwasher now, I don't know how long we're going to have this one in stock for. Something like that. And usually some key words that go along with this limited time uh, tactic is, you know, if something exclusive or limited time offer or sale ends soon, things of kind of that nature. And if you guys have seen The Wolf of Wall Street, one of my favorite movies, Martin Scorsese, he's creating urgency. Remember that scene, Jordan Belford in the diner? He's like, sell me this pen. Why don't you write your name down? I can't. I don't have a pen. See? Supply and demand. <laughs> And Jordan says, see, he's creating urgency. And that's kind of what you're doing here with scarcity. So psychological reactance, what does this mean? Well, this is a theory developed by this gentleman, Jack Brem. And it basically talks about how you react to a decrease in your freedoms. So when your freedoms become scarce, you react in, I don't want to say negative, kind of negative, or you basically don't like it. You react in a way that makes you anxious in that you want them back. You're, pr you're trying to preserve the personal freedoms that you do have. So when choice is limited... The need to retain our freedoms makes us want them even more. Because you start to realize, oh my gosh, if the choices are limited right now, they might be even more limited in the future. So we have to kind of hold our line as far as the freedoms that we do have. And Jack Brem says, you know, by offshoot, the goods and services that are associated with, with the freedoms, you want those even more as well. Because you're interfering with prior access to them, which makes us want the thing even more. This plays out in different periods of our life. 
So when you're young, there's a period in your life called the terrible twos. Pretty sure everybody's gone through this or you've had a son or daughter that are going through this maybe even right now. We're at two children start to view themselves as individuals. Let me just go to the next bullet point right there. They tend to view themselves as individuals versus being like just an extension of mom and dad. They really start to view themselves as separate beings, which brings with it freedoms. So the reason maybe two-year-olds act out when you take away a toy or you take away like a certain sweet food they're reacting against the restrictions that you've imposed on them. So they're reacting against the decrease in their freedoms. Because now they view themselves like, hey, I'm an individual with individual freedoms. There was a study, this plexiglass barrier study. Look at that. There's a there's a spelling mistake that we know and love. Young Barry study. So they had two groups with plexiglass blocking access to a toy and one toy that was unrestricted in access. So you had a group, you had a barrier between a toy and the baby or the two-year-old. And then you had another toy where there, there was no barrier. They could freely access it. In the two groups... One group had a barrier that was higher than the other group. So both groups in this study have the barrier and have the unrestricted access to the toy. It's just one group had a higher barrier than the other. What they saw was that the barrier that was higher saw the toddlers try for the obstructed toy three times faster than with the toy that was unobstructed in that in that group let me make sure i i have this right when the barrier was too short to restrict access to the toy behind it the boy showed no special preference for either of the toys on the average the toy next to the barrier was touched just as quickly as the one behind it but when the barrier was high enough to be a true obstacle the boys went directly to the obstructed toy, making contact with it three times faster than the unobstructed toy. They, the response to the limitation in their freedom, outright defiance. So you're going to limit my access to that toy by having this large fence so I can't get to the toy? I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to go get that toy. It's kind of what that's saying. That's kind of what reactance is and we don't just see it when we're two years old but we see it in our teenage years as well when you become a teenager maybe even like a 16 year old you all of a sudden get new freedoms you can now drive you know, you can have access to travel at your own kind of free will you know the, to an extent but Cialdini kind of talks about this Romeo and Juliet effect where the defiance of parental pleas that should be without the E for Romeo and Juliet to not see each other. So the two families, the what was it, the Capulets and the Montagues, you know, they don't want Romeo and Juliet to see each other. They're feuding with each other. Well, it's driving the passion between Romeo and Juliet closer and closer together it's skyrocketing their love for each other because they're reacting out of this decrease in their freedom to see each other you know they they did a study with 140 colorado teens and they found that parental interference led to greater romantic feelings for the couples that they interviewed for that study and again, this doesn't just happen, you know, when we're little. This happens when we're adults, too. For adults, reactance lies dormant versus with kids, it's floating on the surface. You know, because as adults, we're out in a society, we kind of have to act a certain way. So we kind of keep feelings tucked in and don't really let them out like kids would. So th they give an example of a Kennesaw, Georgia, I believe it was where they passed a law requiring every adult resident to own a gun and ammunition. 
And what they found was gun sales boomed, but they were bought by people outside of the town. They weren't bought by people inside the town. People would actually come out of their way from outside of Kennesaw. And I believe it was Kennesaw. Let me double check for you guys. Yeah, okay, it was Kennesaw. Interviews with Kennesaw store owners revealed that gun buyers were not town residents at all, but visitors. Business is great, but they're almost all being bought up from people from out of town. We've only had two or three local people buy a gun to comply with the law. Only those individuals whose freedom in the matter had not been restricted by the law had the inclination to live by it. So this is kind of interesting. So this is kind of reverse. Like, hey, we're going to make you do something. But the fact that you're making me do something... I don't want to do it. You're reacting out against it. It's kind of like a reverse in the in in a way. There's another example of in Miami-Dade County, they banned phosphate-based cleaning products. So what happened? People reacted against it. Reacted against that loss of freedom. People started hoarding phosphate phosphate-based cleaning products. People actually then came to see the cleaners as a positive that they worked better than the other products. And there was a desire to attain the products after banning, which created this sort of halo effect. So, oh, they banned it. Oh, it must be like better than the other cleaning products in a way. You see, we've, we've talked about that halo effect too, too, like as I mentioned before with authority, where you have like an authority in a certain field and all of a sudden you think... That, you view, you view them as more honest, you know, more empathetic, like in other totally like external things to the authority that they actually have in. You know, they could be like a history professor, but all of a sudden you start to think, okay, he's an authority in history, but he, he's also an authority on finances, something like that. And we kind of see that too with the this clean, these cleaning products. So to kind of piggyback off that idea is this idea of censorship in our response to banned information in that we want to receive it. Like, why are you banning it? Like, I want to know it. You know, <laughs> that's kind of the feeling. So we become more favorable to it, to censored information, as opposed to if it wasn't banned. And we actually start to view it as more true. You start to view the information as more favor favorable, more correct. So they did a study at uh, University of North Carolina on banning speech that opposed co-ed dorm rooms. And what they saw, students became opposed to the idea of co-ed dorm, dorm rooms. The argument seemed more favorable. Let me see if I can find this study for you guys here we go for example when university of north carolina students learned that a speech opposing co-ed dorm rooms would be banned they became more opposed to the idea of co-ed dorms thus without ever hearing the speech the students became more sympathetic to its argument this raises the worrisome possibility that especially clever individuals holding a weak or unpopular position can get us to agree with the position by arranging to have their message restricted. That's a very, very interesting idea there. Book bannings as like another example. You know, when you ban a book, I mean, you kind of want to read them more, don't you? <laughs> Students, this, uh, what was this, uh, Purdue University. The students were shown advertisements for a novel. For half the ads included the statement, a book for adults only restricted to those 21 years and over. The other half of the students read of no such age restriction, 
When the researchers later asked the students to indicate their feelings toward the book, they discovered the same pair of reactions we have noted with other bands. Students who learned of the age restriction wanted to read the books more and believed they would like it more than they did with than they did those who thought their access to the book was unfettered. Case in point, scarce, inform- scarce information can make it more valuable. Hey, if you can only get things from a limited source, it's going to make that information seem more valuable, more correct, etc. So the scarcity double, double, double whammy. What is that? Well, this is exemplified from a story on this beef importing company. Let me see if I can find this. Where was this? Here we go. The company's customers, buyers for supermarkets and other retail food outlets were called on the phone, as usual, by salesperson and asked for a purchase in one of three ways. And I highlight these ways here in the bullet points. One of them was a standard sales presentation. Another was the standard presentation plus telling the customer that the beef that the guy was selling was scarce. The third way, standard sales presentation, telling them the beef was scarce, but also telling them that the news of the scarcity came from an exclusive contact within the beef industry. What they found was customers purchased six times the amount of beef when it was paired with all three of these factors than just the standard sales presentation. And what really set it over the edge was this news of scarcity coming from an exclusive contact. The person's got the inside scoop, the inside baseball, and made that information seem way more valuable, way more exclusive. Like, hey, I was getting the, I was getting the, you know, the news that everybody else wasn't, you know. Reactants. Reduction. So, we talked about reactants, reacting out against the loss to your freedoms. Like we've talked about before in other episodes, people don't really like to be sold. I don't really want to feel like I'm being sold. I don't mind salespeople, but if it's like if they try too, too hard, I don't know, all of a sudden it kind of turns me off a little bit. So Cialdini talks about, you know, you're winning the battle over the reactant response. And how do you do this? How do you do this? this? And this is like if you're a salesman trying to win the battle over somebody else's reaction to you, to your compliance request. Well, you can use other techniques of influence that we've mentioned before, reciprocation, authority. Gosh, yeah, now it's social proof. There we go. Gosh, I'm blanking on them. Yeah, social proof, authority, uh, commitment, consistency, scarcity. I mean, we're talking about scarcity now, but you guys know what I mean. You could mention a drawback to the compliance request. It's like a drawback to the certain item that you're selling somebody on. We talked about that um, in one of the in uh, one of the episodes. You could you could use the but you are free method to give somebody the chance to back out. You're basically giving them the freedom to say no, which Dr. Cialdini talks about. It doubles the success rate compared to the standard request. So optimal conditions, what are these? These are the conditions in which scarcity has like the most of, or what makes scarcity works, ways in which scarcity works the best. As I take a swig of my water. So scarcity is more effective at certain times than others. 
So they highlight this in the cookie study that they do with Stephen Warshall. And they're going to, this is going to come up a couple other times in this section. Two groups with access to a jar of cookies with different quantities of cookies in, in two different jars. And they found that the group that had the jar with way less cookies viewed those cookies as more favorable, like they wanted those cookies more. You know, we see another famous example of scarcity is this new Coke fiasco, which uh, Mark Robert and Eric Hunley of America's Untold Stories did a fantastic video on the Coke Wars between Pepsi and Coca-Cola. Great video, and they talk about the new Coke fiasco in that episode. So this happened in 1985, and Coca-Cola had done market research that showed that there was this clear preference for new Coke. And at the time of the tests, new Coke was the scarce item. So in those taste tests, people favored new Coke because it wasn't out in the world yet, in the market, is kind of what Cialdini is getting at. But when new Coke was launched, they replaced it with old Coke. All of, a sudden, all of a sudden, old Coke was now scarce, making it way more valuable and making Coca-Cola get tons of pushback for this. So optimal conditions for scarcity, one of them, new scarcity. So in that cookie study, they compared constant scarcity versus new scarcity. So in the constant scarcity situation, each group started with and ended with the same amount of cookies. Now, there was another group. Some participants were given the jar of 10 cookies, then had it taken away and replaced with the jar of two cookies. So in the constant scarcity, you know, you just had one jar of 10 cookies, another jar of 20 cookies. Okay, they viewed the ten, jar of 10 more favorable. In the other group, jar of 10 cookies, jar of 20 cookies. All of a sudden, jar of 10 cookies taken away, replaced with a jar of two. And that drop produced an even more favorable response to those cookies because they were more recently unavailable. There was a brand new scarcity introduced to it. And that's what Dr. Cialdini talks about. Newly experienced scarcity is way more powerful. And this could kind of be seen in some revolutions, like when he gives an example in the USSR, when conditions temporarily started to improve, but I think it was uh, Gorbachev. Let me go to that section for you guys. I think it was Gorbachev. Yeah. Nope, this was it. Yeah, I think it was Gorbachev who gave the Soviet people, like, freedoms. Then all of a sudden there was a coup, Gorbachev kicked out, and freedoms were taken away to go back to the old way of doing things, and people revolted against it. Like, no, all of a sudden there's a new scarcity and kind of a reactance to freedoms being taken away, right? And this is the, the theory from James Davies, where revolutions occur when improving conditions are met with a drastic turn in the opposite direction. So you're given some taste of a better life, then you have it taken away. And this could kind of maybe explain the racial conflict in the 1960s, where the black population had huge po political gains after World War II, and all of this change was halted by the perceived defeats in most of America, in which uh, Dr. Cialdini writes, in which people saw, okay, most places were still segregated. There was acts of violence against, you know, people who were integrating into schools, school integration, uh, blacks and whites going to the same schools. You also had the income of the black family decrease by 74% compared to the comparable white family. 
And then, the, yep, here's my Gorbachev example where granted Soviet citizens new liberties and the coup takes place. They try to reinstall those those uh, the, those measures. They're taking away those liberties and people protested, wanting to ensure that the new freedoms were kept. So there's another optimal condition for scarcity. So we talked about, what did we talk about? Newly scarce. And then also when things are scarce because of competition. Items that are more scarce due to the demand are viewed as more valuable. So going back to the cookie study, the group that had the cookies taken away from 10 to 2, they were given one of two reasons for it. One of the reasons was they were given the count of cookies by mistake. And then another reason some of the groups were given was that they needed to give some of the cookies to another group to meet the demand of cookies for that group. And the group that was told this reason rated those cookies way higher. Excuse me. And again, to hearken this point, we want things most when we are in competition for them. Think about it. Like your interest in a romantic partner increases with the advent of a new lover. Um, oh, I'm sorry. A real estate agent saying there is another potential buyer on the house you are looking at makes you want to buy that house. There's a, the, a story that Cialdini highlights where Barry Diller, who is like a executive at ABC, I think, and he was betting on uh, the Poseidon adventure, and he was trying to buy the rights to it so he could show it on ABC. Total loss. Like, he wasn't going to make any money on that, but he bet on it because it was the first time that networks had to bid on getting the license to show the movie. So there was a fierce betting war going on for it. And he just got caught up in the commotion of it. Another optimal condition is the distinctiveness distinction, where we prefer to be seen as a special resource. But it's kind of a balance because we want to fit in with the group. Again, we're tribal creatures, but also we want to have our own take on it. So... There was this incident that happened where the USA Army Rangers used to be the only like military uh, unit or unit of the military that wore black berets. Well, in June 14th, 2001, all soldiers were now told that they would don the black beret. So all of a sudden, it makes them feel makes it feel less special. And the the Army Rangers felt kind of disrespected by it. And it didn't mean as much if everybody was wearing them. Well, what ended up happening was the Rangers got to select a different color beret. I believe they chose, oh gosh, what was that? I think it was blue. Let's see here. Yeah, I believe it was blue. They selected, oh, buckskin tan. Okay, I'm sorry, buckskin tan. I knew it started with a B. Buckskin tan. All of a sudden, my standing desk went down. <laughs> All right, defense. Coming up close, guys. How do we defend against this? Well, you basically have to recognize it. And this is kind of what Cialdini talks about with all the other defenses to the earlier levers of influence that we talked about. Don't get caught up in the mania. And you have to recognize when you start to get that sweeping arousal due to the scarce resource. Kind of like Barry Diller did when he was uh, bidding on the rights to the Poseidon Adventure, which is a movie. I don't know if I mentioned that before, but yeah, older movie. You recognize that you're getting like that sweeping arousal. You're getting caught up in the mania, the FOMO, the fear of missing out. And you have to ask yourself a couple questions. One of the questions, actually, you ask yourself one question. Why do I need this item? Why do I actually need this item? Do I actually need this item? Think about going back to the cookie study. Even though the scarce cookies were rated as more valuable, 
they weren't rated as better tasting. They're still the same cookie, right? So why do you actually need the thing that is less in supply? Do you actually need it? Because the arousal comes from the possession of the item, not necessarily from your experience with the item. So keep that in mind as a defense. Look out for that sweeping arousal feeling and then ask yourself, hey, do I really need this product? And to summarize, you know, in, in scarcity, uh, in this chapter on scarcity, we learned about loss aversion. You know, we just don't want to lose things. We would rather not lose than win. Losses hurt more than gains win. Or losses hurt more than gains feel good, essentially. So scar- And scarcity holds for two reasons. Things are difficult to obtain are usually more valuable, and as things become less accessible, we lose freedoms, i.e. the reactance theory, and we try to retain those freedoms. We see reactance in a person's younger years with the terrible twos and the teenage years, both years of defining time periods of a person's life where you start to see yourself as an individual and as somebody separate, and along with that, you feel like you deserve and need those freedoms of an individual don't want to be tied down we talked about censorship and how limiting access to information makes it more favorable we talked about how you can optimize scarcity by making something both newly scarce more recently scarce and also making it scarce due to an increased demand for it an increase in competition for that particular item And then lastly, we talked about how to defend against it, recognizing that arousal pattern, and then asking yourself the question, do you really need this thing that you're getting aroused about? And that's going to do it, guys, for this chapter on scarcity. Tune in next time where we're going to talk about commitment and consistency next time. Oh yeah, and by the way, those other levers of influence, authority, social proof, liking, that was the one that I was missing, and reciprocation. (laughs) We tend to comply with those who are most like us. That was the liking principle. Anyway, guys, I know this was a longer episode. Thanks for sticking with me till the end. Really, really cool book. Um, Very applicable in everyday life. And I really appreciate you joining me on this journey through Influence the Psychology of Persuasion. We got a new interview coming out tomorrow. Check it out. It'll be on the Cheatash podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, Samsung. There's an RSS website for it as well. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. My name is Chris. This has been Cheatash. Take care, everybody.